The last Call of Duty game I bought on release was Modern Warfare 2 back in 2009. That's when I really felt the fatigue of the series. I played every PC release starting with the original way back in 2003 and I played COD 3 because it came packaged with my PlayStation 3. I did eventually buy Modern Warfare 3 when it dropped down in price but only because it was the final part of the trilogy that I had already sunk around 12 hours and 80 pounds on and I wanted to see what happened to Soap and Price after being left beaten in the desert and on the run. Though I never played the Black Ops series. I mentioned this to hopefully try and get you into my mindset going into Infinite Warfare. I had and still have no interest in the multiplayer side of the game. I played a bit of it in Call of Duty 4 and I knew then that this wasn't what I look for in a multiplayer shooter. Battlefield has always been my go-to online shooter and continues to be so to this day. As is well documented, the announcement for Infinite Warfare faced a, shall we say, unexpected backlash. I honestly can't see why, but people really hated it. Maybe most people don't like space stuff, which is just absurd to me. I love space stuff. But the reveal trailer did nothing to make me change my mind on the series. This would just be another card to come and go and be forgotten about in a year's time. Obviously, the Modern Warfare remaster changed my opinion slightly, but then other details started coming out about the new campaign. You get command of a battleship and can pick and choose what missions to do and in what order. You get to take part in dogfights with your own space fighters. There are zero-g gunfights and you can blow out windows on spaceships to suck enemies out into the void. This sounded like enough for me. More than any of the previous games, which seems to be just adding in gimmicks each year, this looked to be actually trying to do something different. And, coupled with the COD 4 remaster, I decided that this would be the first time I've bought a Call of Duty game on release for 7 years. I didn't pay full retail price though, bollocks to that. I bought a CD key for £45. It pays to shop around, folks. Now, if the internet is anything to go by, the latest Call of Duty sucks and is terrible and you're a stupid child if you enjoy it. Whereas the new Battlefield is the second coming of Jesus and is faithful and respectful to the people that died and you are an ungrateful wretch if you think otherwise. And from a multiplayer perspective, Battlefield is what it does best and is great fun because of it. However, the much lauded single player campaign did not live up to its reputation in my eyes. I won't go into detail about it here as I already did so in another video which I've linked in the description below. But in summary, it didn't live up to the promises made by the developers before its release. I bring this up for a specific reason that really surprised me when playing the Infinite Warfare campaign. I cared more about what happened to a robot from the future in Call of Duty than I did about any of the characters in any of the Battlefield campaign stories. Let's take a quick look at this bit of a scene. Looks like this is the end of the line, partner. I think I'm scared, sorry. Me too. Yeah, stay with me. That scene stirred up more emotion in me than any of the scenes from any of the Battlefield campaign stories. Obviously that wasn't the whole scene and it's of course taken completely out of context here, but I wouldn't want to ruin that moment for anyone who hasn't played it yet. But it took me completely by surprise. Now I'm not saying that this moved me to tears and I was sobbing softly, no, and stroking the screen and his little robot faceplate thing, but I did think, no, I don't want this to happen, don't let this happen, are they really going to let this happen? But you know, in a totally butch, manly way, while I was drinking beer and punching someone and getting a blowjob. Now, many other attempts at pulling our emotional strings are made throughout the Infinite Warfare campaign, and for me, none of them came close to being as moving as that one scene. Although it has to be said that this is a morbid and depressing story. I'm not saying that in a bad way, like, oh, it's so bad, it's depressing. It's just a depressing, like, a lot of people die. This is a grim story. This, this is not a happy story. But the fact that they did a better job at stirring my emotions than a game set in World War I, arguably the most depressing of all the wars, really says something about the writing in this game. That said, the rest of the narrative doesn't really match that high point. The enemy is never really given proper motivation to be starting a war, the main bad guy only turns up to die, and considering that you're the commander of a battleship, you spend the whole game taking orders from everybody else, except your robot buddy. But from my experience from the games back in the day, this is fairly standard for a Call of Duty campaign. Throughout the Modern Warfare series, I was never really 100% sure exactly who I was fighting and why, and you always tend to be the busy man who has to do everything, other than open doors. Other people only seem to let you open doors in those games if it involved an explosive pack, but bugger me if they won't trust you to use a doorknob. But at least it made more sense in those games, you were not in charge. In Infinite Warfare though, you're the boss, it's your ship and your missions. 
Why is your subordinate giving you orders? On the flip side, most characters are fairly likeable and entertaining, and the voice acting is on excellent form here. I didn't notice any flat or out of place bland deliveries. Apart from Lewis Hamilton's weird cameo, which was ultimately pointless. So much so that I actually didn't recognise it was him at first. You only see him twice, and it was only on his second appearance, where you directly face him in a very brief conversation, that I actually noticed. Conor McGregor also seemed a bit of a waste here. He doesn't say anything, is on screen for all of 7 seconds, and just punches you in the face. Fitting, perhaps, but I was expecting him to be some sort of second in command. Kind of like Stone Cold Steve Austin's character in the first Expendables film. This is the first Call of Duty game I've ever played with these celebrity cameos in, at least that I've been aware of. And while those two seemed a bit wasted, at least Kit Harrington did have some fairly decent dialogue and it was delivered pretty well, but his character wasn't explored and as I said earlier, he only really makes an appearance to die. Spoiler alert. But it just seems like a bit of a, a waste of time and effort to get these celebrity names on, because I don't really think Call of Duty's sales would suffer without celebrity endorsements. So in terms of character and their development and the way it's acted out, this is surprisingly strong and certainly more involving than the Battlefield campaign. It's such a shame the story behind it all didn't really match that. But what about the gameplay? Well, after more than five years away from the series, it feels like the core shooting mechanics are the same as ever, which is by no means a bad thing. Say what you like about the series, but its core gunplay has always been immensely strong. It's just a shame that this vision of the future is one where all guns feel like SMGs. Not even the sniper rifles felt heavy and that they packed a punch. It's all pew 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 with hardly any boom boom boom. Even the shotguns didn't have enough of a kick for me. With each gun it does have a secondary fire mode though, and these vary in usefulness. Some will just switch between a small scope and an iron sight, but others are more useful and you can turn your gun from a sniper rifle to an assault rifle, essentially allowing you to carry three guns around instead of two. There's also little tech gimmicks, which are entertaining enough on the odd occasion that they actually came in useful, such as hacking enemy robots, but they always just seem like just another method of killing things, rather than a tie turning tactic. Truth be told, the same effects could have been achieved quicker with just a well placed grenade, and then you wouldn't have the whole little cutscene and little intermittent bits in between, and it'd be a bit less flashy. But they're just alternatives to already existing methods. The gunplay does get shaken up a bit though when you enter Zero G. Equipped with a grappling hook to pull yourself around the area, or to pull enemies in close with a good old neck snap, and dedicated buttons to rotate yourself around on the spot, this can get pretty disorientating, but I felt it added enough variety to keep it as an entertaining change of pace, and it was used sparingly enough so as not to become overused and tedious. That, and the simple fact that blazing through a dogfight and gunning down goons in Zero G, then blowing a hole in their bridge and destroying the ship from the inside before you zoom away in your spaceship is all sorts of awesome. And frankly, there is nothing else out there that I'm aware of that lets you do this with such cinematic flair. Which brings us nicely onto the dogfights. These were not at all what I was expecting. Well, I mean, they are dogfights with enemy fighters zipping around larger gunships and capital ships, and sometimes planet side dodging around factory towers and cliff faces. It's all very cinematic, explosive, intense and loud. It just controls in a really weird way. Basically, it controls the same way as the Zero G gunfights, except you have a booster instead of a grappling hook. Whereas in any other aerial combat game, you'd be constantly moving forward, with you either boosting ahead or breaking for sharp turns, this has you only move forward when you hold down the forward control. So if you're not pressing a direction, your ship isn't moving. This takes a bit of getting used to and made me have to completely rewire my brain to properly pull off tight turns. The way the actual ship to ship combat works is also a little odd and off putting at first. You get an enemy ship in your target, then you hold down a button to lock onto them. Once you're locked on, your ship kicks into autopilot and follows them. You still have some control, enough to shift your aim and to get your targets lined up with the shoot here blip that leads in front of their ship, but it essentially becomes an on rail shooter at this point. Which does sound terribly boring, but I eventually realised why this was included. Yes, they could have left all control with us, the players, but that would have led to plenty of situations where you'd be tailing an enemy fighter only to turn too tight or not tight enough and bash into the side of a capital ship or against a clip face or a factory smokestack. 
What I'm saying is that this feature seems to me to have been included to keep you feeling like the ace fighter pilot that you're playing as by taking away just enough control to keep that illusion but still leaving enough need there to require some actual aiming ability. So, the new dogfighting feature was a welcome addition for me. There are only a small handful of these missions that are actually required to complete the story, with most of them being consigned to optional side missions. I think this was a smart move, as even though I enjoyed them, I can imagine many people really didn't like them. So, like with the Zero-G combat, they kept it as more as an occasional change of pace and didn't force it in so much that it became a chore to play through. However, I do want to take a moment to mention something that came to annoy me a tad with the space combat. You are given the ability to choose between a selection of missions throughout most of the game. Basically, you get several optional side missions that unlock new abilities and weapons along with the main story missions. Many of these side missions, as I said, are pure dogfighting. When you select these missions, you go straight from the mission select screen to your cockpit and have to go through an interactive launch sequence before a very short loading screen drops you into the action. The first time this played out, I thought it was really cool, giving you the feeling of being a fighter pilot embarking on another mission, charging up your fighter and waiting for the countdown to hit zero as all the military gargle chatters away in your earpiece before blasting away into the cosmos. After about three or four times though, and especially after about seven or eight times, this whole process gets tedious, and I'd have honestly rather just had a short cutscene or just jump straight into the action. A small niggle admittedly, but a persistent one that particularly irked me. So, the story is pretty bland, but with interesting and well fleshed out characters that are given enough screen time to actually give us some sort of toss about them, and the gameplay is solid enough to carry the game through with some pleasant new mechanics that aren't overused to the point of annoyance. This is also the first Call of Duty game I've played that had any wall running at jetpacks. But aside from what I think was about two or three scripted instances, these abilities were pretty much useless and personally I'd have left that sort of thing to Titanfall. Personally, in the battle between COD and Battlefield, at least on the campaign front, Infinite Warfare takes it. It's an odd situation to find yourself in when you care more about a wisecracking robot that has no face than any of the people set in actual wars that really did happen where people actually died. Personally, I'd say Battlefield oversold its single player campaign. And maybe the Infinite Warfare campaign isn't as good as I think it is, but because I wasn't expecting anything even semi half decent, what is mediocre was merely perceived as really good. I can't be sure on that, but I can be sure that there's only one of these campaigns I can see myself playing again, and it's the one set up there in the big black void above us that has Russians from Mars. Does this mean I'll get back into buying Call of Duty every year again? No. This one had enough differences from the Modern Warfare series that I thought it was worth a punt and worth getting back into after all this time. If they do do a sequel to the Infinite Warfare game, then I imagine I will pick it up, but on the whole I'll be taking this series one game at a time, seeing if each one has anything different to offer. And really, if everyone did that, then they would be forced to put more effort into each game, instead of just reskinning it and adding in a double jump every so often. It's all very good moaning about the game and swearing it off as terrible, but if you've already bought it, the developers and publishers really don't care. You've given them your money, they've won. So skip Call of Duty for a couple of years, come back later on, maybe then they'll let them start making some changes. Oh, and Salem Koch? That's a terrible baddie name. Terrible. It sounds like someone tried to sniff in some snot before sneezing. Anyway, if you've made it this far, well done, give yourself a goldfish. This is your baby little channel and I would very much like to hit 100 subscribers one day, heading for those big triple figures. So subscribe now so that if that day ever comes, you can moan about me for selling out and that the channel isn't as good as it used to be back in the day. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.